Carlos. Thank you very much, uh, Jill and Carlos, for the introduction. And <clears throat> I'm very glad and proud to present here the anatomy of the fibrous skeleton. Uh, this is my clinic in uh, Münster in, in the northern part of Germany. And <clears throat> in this clinic in 1927, uh, Erich Eichhoff um, was and he um, had a publication about uh, the Cavan's disease and he <clears throat> presented the, for the first time the Eichhoff's test uh, for De Cavan's disease. And uh, in many books, it is uh, his test shown and uh, it was named Finkelstein test. You can see here on the, on the left picture. This is my clinic. And perhaps you know my illustrations from uh, the cover from Journal of Hand Surgery. Here, this was the first one of um, in 2017. Uh, and it was Dupuytren's disease uh, to show all the different um, cords and fibers that you can have here in Dupuytren's disease. But today, <clears throat> We have to talk about the fibrous skeleton. And this, the term fibrous skeleton comes not from the hand, but from the heart and the, the area where are the valves of the heart. This is called the fibrous skeleton. And the fibrous skeleton of the hand <clears throat> is something uh, else and you can't find in normal anatomy textbooks or uh, atlases of anatomy they show only anatomy without the fibrous tissue. This fibrous tissue is always away and you can't see. And so <clears throat> it's very difficult to remember and uh, to find out. And if you see in an operation theater or in anatomy, uh, you only know the anatomy without and not with the fibrous uh, skeleton. And it seems to be uh, an irregular system of uh, fibers and it's difficult to understand. And so the anatomy has no interest to have a detailed anatomy in, on it and you can't find And <clears throat> What else is, here's a <clears throat> citation from uh, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe from 1819, near 200 years ago, you only see what you already know and understand. And I think <clears throat> this is today my job uh, to show you that you know and understand. At first, <clears throat> this is the uh, uh, basic structures of the mammalian skin. Uh, on the top, you have the, the skin, the epidermis and dermis. And below that, you have the first layer of fat that is the superficial adipose tissue or campus uh, fat. And Peter Camper described it in <clears throat> about 70, 50 or 60. This is a fat layer, but it's very important for to have a smooth skin. Below that, uh, most animals have the paniculus carnosus. Uh, this is, <coughs> uh, uh, muscle inside of the fat. Uh, I'll show it a little bit later. And in human, uh, this is only a thin fascia. Uh, uh, this is called scarpa's fascia or a superficial fascia. And below that fascia, you have a, a, a deep as opposed tissue with much more bigger uh, fat cells. And that's the scarpa's fat layer before we go to the deep fascia that covers the muscles. Here is a fascia cutaneous flap where you can see the skin, the campus fascia, scarpus fascia, the uh, scarpus fat uh, layer and the deep fascia, which is a very good <coughs> vascularized for the fascia cutaneous flaps. And here <coughs> it's an, an publication from the Journal of Anatomy about the paniculus carnosus. And you can see here several mammals who have the paniculus carnosus <clears throat> all over the body. 
And here, this is the actual uh, presentation of the remnants of the paniculus canosus in the human body. It's not only the platysma and the palmaris brevis, but also the palmaris longus, the serratus muscle, the pectoral muscle, and the trapezius muscle seems to be remnants of uh, this muscle. And in human, it is mostly a superficial fascia, but you can see here <clears throat> on the right one, there are numbers. And what these numbers means <clears throat> is the numbers of nerve structures per square centimeter. And if you look to the skin with 64 uh, nerve <coughs> structures per square centimeter, and the superficial fascia, the scapus fascia, has the half of them, half of the, <coughs> the nerve structures of the, of the skin is in, in these uh, fascial structures. And we don't know until today, not what many functions this uh, fibrous skeleton has. This is such a rich innovation. And there are so many um, Ruffini bodies and <coughs> there's so many to investigate in the future about this nerve fibers in this system. And what you can see here is um, a cross section of the, of the lower limb uh, where you have a, a very difficult vein system. And you have also the, the skin, the campus fat layer, the scapus fat fascia, the scapus fat layer, and the deep fascia. And <coughs> the vein system in different um, systems, but the fascial system has also <coughs> the function that the fascial constructions um, opens the veins and enables the arterial venous pump by compression of the, <coughs> the arterial venous uh, construction here. In the finger, we have the construction <clears throat> the connections at the tip of the fingers with the bone to the skin. It is by the retinacular cutis and this, the fingertip is very important for, uh, for sensibility and for uh, <clears throat> um, mechanical resistance to so much strength. And you can see here also Flint's ligament and Cleland's ligament and the spiral oblique retinacular ligaments. There are so many structures that are very important uh, to the functions of the finger. And here, a little bit more proximal in the, in the palm, a cross section through the palm, you can see the facial constructions from the skin to the bone. It's much more complicated, much more complex. As you can see here on the Palmer side and on the dorsal side, there are different uh, structures about this. On the palmer side, you can see many short fibers. On the dorsal side, you see less. And <coughs> the dorsal skin, there are long fibers and less fibers, and you have a great elasticity. And on the palmer side, the palmar skin, there are much fibers and short fibers, and that's a great stability. And it's nearly impossible to, uh, <coughs> to lift some folds on the palmar side. Like here, it's not possible. On the dorsal side, it's very easy. And this, these are the difference between the palmar, the grip side, and the dorsal side. You can see here, uh, and these fibers are connected to the palmar aponeurosis. And the palmar aponeurosis, it's a longitudinal fasciculi. <coughs> um, and the, the longitudinal fibers of the systems are not a distal extension of the palmaris longus. They are two different structures that are connected, that are perfectly connected, but that are uh, from evolutional point of view, uh, two different structures. And the palmar aponeurosis is 
present. Also, <coughs> if uh, there is no palmaris longus tendon or palmaris longus tendon or muscle, but the palmar aponeurosis is very rarely absent, though you have a palmaris longus muscle. And these very <coughs> rare cases are congenital uh, muscular hypertrophy patients, like here. One single hand is, uh, has a congenital muscle, muscular hypertrophy. And uh, here you can see the huge palmaris brevis muscle. And below, after resection of this huge palmaris brevis muscle, there was no palmar aponeurosis. And these are the very rare cases where you have no palmar aponeurosis. And <clears throat> the palmar aponeurosis, the longitudinal fibers, starting at the wrist level at the rasetta, the area of the rasetta, and are ending at the area of the distal palmar crease, you can see here. Uh, below that, a little bit below, there are transverse fibers, and these were described first time by Todd Skog in 1967. He came from Uppsala in Sweden. As you can see here, the transverse fibers, and they are <coughs> in, in the area of the fingers, very, very rarely affected by Dupuytren's disease. These are normally free. And on the radial extent of these fibers, I talk a little bit later. And a little bit more distal, these are called the natatory ligaments. That, that are not true ligaments. They are fibers that are <coughs> uh, holding uh, the commissure. And it's uh, not a real ligament, but they can become a ligament in Dupuytren's disease. And Wilhelm Brauner, he uh, published this uh, in the end of the 19, uh, 1880s. <coughs> he, was, he worked in Leipzig in uh, Germany. And from his clinic, I show later another structure. And you can see also an extent to the radial side to the thumb. And Wilhelm Brauner, he published a lot of uh, very fantastic books <coughs> uh, about the anatomy, also the veins of the hand a big book. And here you can see again the finger from the, from the palmar lateral side. You can see here the, the fibers that are not a real ligament. <coughs> but it's called uh, natatory ligament. And they are connected to several other structures uh, I will describe later. And here, what is very important for <coughs> the clinic, the nerves and vessels are always dorsal of the natatory ligament. You never find an, an artery or never find a nerve that are running over this <coughs> structure. And this is uh, very important. You have no spiral cord or spiral nerve here in this area. <clears throat> in this area, you are safe if you cut until uh, the skin, until the natatory ligament, and you, you have never cut a nerve. If you look to the radial extensions, the skook <coughs> ligament and the brownness ligament and the natatory to, ligament to the, to the thumb, there are two structures, two different structures. And these are called the proximal and distal palmar commissural ligaments. You can find here in this Dippetons case, you have uh, both the distal one and the proximal one. And here you can see uh, <coughs> when they are open in Dippetons disease, when they are affected. So what is... Um, very important in Dupuytren's disease, especially in early diagnosis of uh, Dupuytren's disease. These are the Grapov fibers. And Grapov worked uh, in the clinic of uh, Wilhelm Braune in Leipzig. And in 1887, <coughs> he talked about, or he wrote about uh, these small fibers that are 
connected the palmar upper neurosis and the fascia to the skin. And these small fibers um, <clears throat> have here sometimes, if they are affected by Duplon's disease, have small indentations. You can see here on the, at the pip palmar crease and here at the proximal palmar crease of the finger here, <clears throat> there are small indentations. And these are called the Hughes-Johnson signs. And Hughes-Johnson uh, published this with the shortest publication I've ever read. You can see here the Hughes-Johnson sign early for of early Dupton's culture. And uh, he, he wrote, wrote, it would be nice <clears throat> to have a sign with one's own name. I feel the eponym Hughes Johnson sign is indicated in this case for Hughes Johnson is not only the doctor, but the patient as well. And that's the complete uh, publication of him. And I, but the term, I think it's, uh, it's good to see. And here you can see on the right <coughs> here, the connections of the palmar operonorosis to the skin. And if they contract, <coughs> the, the skin will be, have, you have here the indentation. And here in the uh, pisiform area, you can see also here some small of Hughes Johnson signs, <coughs> small indentations. And this is a rare case of, um, of the area of the hand where you can have Dupuytren's disease. It's only one or 2% or less. You can see here. And then <clears throat> a little bit more deeper, you have the septae of Le Gieu and Jouvara. And you can see here, and there are nine septae. One on the radial side of the first lumbrical muscle, then <clears throat> two on, the, on, the, on each side of the uh, flexor tendons of the index fingers. Then again, the lumbrical muscles with the nerves and arteries. Then again, between the two uh, flexor tendons, and there are altogether nine septa, you can see here. And these septa are connected <coughs> on the top of the, on the palmar side of the interosseous muscles, muscles with uh, here a strong connections and they are connected here to the bone. And this were first described by Foltz in 1865. These are the connections from the palmar side to the bone here, you can see. And this was uh, Felix Legue. Uh, he worked in Paris together with uh, Ernest uh, Jouvara and he came from Romania and <clears throat> they described here uh, in 1892, des de la pomme de la main. <clears throat> and this was the first really good description of this septa. And here is a, was a patient with an amputation of the, of the hand and you can see here very good the septa which are very strong and they act also together with the Skooks ligament and the <coughs> palmar aponeurosis together as a pulley. And this pulley is as strong as, than the A2 pulley of the, uh, of the proximal phalanx. So it's a very important pulley for the flexor tendons. In operations in Dupuytren's disease, you can see the, uh, the septa very good. And it's also important to remove <coughs> a lot of uh, these affected um, things. Here from the lateral side, you can see here the septa that are running from the palmar aponeurosis to the <coughs> deep part, to the interosseous fascia, you can see here. And here you can see on the left side, <coughs> a resected Dupuytren corn area where you can see here the, the septa of Ligure Juvara here in this area. But what is very important, they are on top, they are surrounding the A1 pulley and it's in Dupuytren's disease, I think it's very important to preserve 
the A1 pulley, which is in most cases not affected in dipterous disease. And this pulley should be preserved if you remove the palmar aponeurosis pulley uh, by the septa of Ligures at Juvara. Here in the lateral cross section, you can see here <coughs> again, the, here in blue, the Ligure and Juvara, Juvara <coughs> septum. They're here connected to the palm and to the palmar side of the intarsus muscle and the um, pretendinous fibers of the palmar aponeurosis. Here again, uh, the septa illustrations long ago, and here is the separation of the flexor tendons and the lumbrical muscles and arteries and nerves here. They are separated by this septa. Here from uh, Boysen Muller from 1972, uh, a very good photograph of this septa. So. A little bit more distal, <coughs> you can see here the Gosset fiber and Jean Gosset uh, described them in 1972. They are coming from the end of uh, the palmar aponeurosis and um, you can see here in the finger, here the red one on the finger side. They're running from this side to the <coughs> deeper part of the finger, that's uh, the, the cord. <coughs> and the lateral digital sheath I talk a little bit later on. These are the real connections between the palmar aponeurosis and uh, the area of the finger. And the other part <coughs> that is important, um, Jean-Michel Tomin described them in uh, also in the 70s. <coughs> and you can see here these fibers running um, from the, sorry, from the <clears throat> head of the metacarpal bones and uh, the fascia of the lumbrical muscles to the lateral side of the finger. And sometimes you can see here small <clears throat> uh, impressions here of the skin in this area, these are the, insertions of the fibers and here also on the lateral side of the little finger <coughs> these are insertions of the tomines fibers or the, of the lateral digital sheath to the skin on the lateral side of the finger they are also <coughs> very often in fact involved in the dupotrans disease you can see here from the lateral side of the the head of the and the capsule of the metacarpal head, and here the lumbrical muscles to the lateral side of the finger sheath. More <coughs> distal and uh, beginning most from uh, of the pip jo joint, <coughs> you have here the John Cleland's ligaments. He described it uh, first in 1860. And you can see here the diagonal fibers of these <coughs> structures. And they are always, if you have an operation on Dupatrans from the palmar side, they're laying dorsal of the, of the nerves and uh, of the dorsal of the vessels. They are connected to the skin. And here you can see also the Cleland's ligament here on the lateral side of the fingers to the skin. And there are several portions of these uh, small fibers <coughs> that you can find. In, on the ulnar side of the, of the hand, you have here the um, abductor digiti minimi cord that is very important in uh, Dipotrans disease because <coughs> in many cases you can't feel this. Uh, this uh, cord before you operate. But if you look, you nearly always find some cords like here in this finger. And the, the fascia of the abductor digiti minimi and the distal insertion here is always often uh, infected. 
involved in the Dipitos disease and uh, Nicholas Barton uh, <coughs> made a very good publication on this very early. So I call it very often the Barton's card here. And this is very important to remove, to have a low <coughs> recurrence rate in Dipitron's disease on the other side of the finger. And here now, these ligaments are <coughs> mostly involved in Dipitron's disease in the, in the finger. And they are the Grayson's ligament <coughs> described 1941 in Manchester by uh, Dr. Grayson. And these fibers you can see here, are crossing here from the radial side to the ulnar side and from the ulnar side to the, uh, to the radial side. And the normal angle is about 45 degrees to proximal to each side. And you can see here in the cross section again, <coughs> here the red ones and the, the green ones, <coughs> they are different uh, Grayson ligaments that are crossing here. And they are starting here in this area <coughs> of the uh, strong connective tissue, where are also the, the pulleys are connected to the bone. And I call this area here, where also the Cleland ligament starts. I call this area, <coughs> can see here a little bit better. Uh, I call it here <laughs> the corda elegans because in this area you can uh, suture a lot of um, <coughs> material for pulley reconstructions or for um, reconstructions of the, um, of the palmar plate or so on. And here between the Grayson's ligament and the Cleland's ligament, you can see here on the side, there's a space where you have always can find the arteries and nerves. And these fibers are crossing and holding the skin that your <coughs> skin is very uh, flexible and, and on the other hand, uh, very strong. And here you can see the, in normal cases, the, the pulley is not involved, but they are crossing here on the top of the other side. These are normal. Um, Grayson's ligament, which you can find in a normal finger. In Dupuytren's disease, <coughs> these fibers are much stronger, much thicker. And in, in the bent finger, if the finger is flexed, they are not 45 degrees, but <coughs> 90 degrees to the length axis of the finger. You can see here also in a flexed finger, they are 90 degrees to the <coughs> longitudinal axis of this finger. And these um, Grayson's ligament have a very often a bone insertion at the base of the middle phalanx. You can see here below the scalpel and the, the pincep, this is a bone insertion and you have sometimes a very uh, a bone spike <coughs> where these fibers can um, connect to the, uh, to the bone here. And sometimes it's necessary to resect this bone spike. Here again, <coughs> the fiber system of the finger uh, in the proximal <coughs> part, you can see here in the red one, the septae of Le Gueux et Jouvara with the tendons and the lumbrical muscles and the nerves, the Skook ligament here in violet and the Gossé's ligament here in, uh, in light blue, the Tumin's fibers here in uh, turquoise and the <coughs> more distal, the, the Grayson's ligament, and here <coughs> also the, the fibers of the natatory ligament. And if you have here a Gossé's cord that is in fact affected here in the red one, and some of the uh, Grayson's ligaments that are affected, and if this cord comes together with a Dupuytren's disease, we have this here in white now, the, the affected cord. And if this <coughs> cord is growing, the nerve is pulled to the palmar side 
by this cord. And this is proximal to the palma, uh, to the natatory ligament. And you can have here a, a spiral nerve around the, the cord. It is just proximal to the natatory ligament. And you can also have this spiral nerve distal to the natatory ligament. And these are very dangerous area <clears throat> if you do the operation on digital trans disease. Here you can have injuries very easily to the nerve. You can see here, this is uh, the cord here of the dip trans, and you can see here the, <coughs> the, the nerve running, and here the artery running over the, the, the cord just proximal to the natatory, just distal to the natatory ligaments that are here. Just distal. And that's a very dangerous area for, for, in, for injuries of these nerves. For the arteries, there is an, another part very <coughs> uh, dangerous for injuries. You can see here the, the palmar cutaneous artery here. And here at the distal part of the A2 pulley, you can see here the arcus palmaris proximalis, and here distal to the A2, the A4 pulley, the distal palmar arc of the finger. And if the dipetrin cord is here affected, you can see it like this. This part of the artery is fixed by this little uh, artery that's running below the, <coughs> the flexor tendon and um, inside of the, of the bone, this, um, the vessels for it. And this part is fixed. And if the cord is growing, this artery is fixed. And then you find this, uh, some very sharp curves of the artery. And if you want to remove uh, the cord, it's very easy to cut here the artery in this area. These are the very dangerous parts <coughs> for Dipetrans disease, um, for the arteries and nerves in affected fibrous skeleton. So the fibrous skeleton is very <coughs> complex, but uh, not irregular. It is uh, a very <coughs> good system of holding the skin, a very intelligent system. And <clears throat> for the future, I think we will learn much more about innovation of these structures. And I hope you have um, your, your picture of this fibrous skeleton of the hand is now a little bit clearer. And if you see next time, <clears throat> something like this, you perhaps find some <clears throat> good structures with your luck. Thank you very much.